Hello everyone, thank you for being here. We are live and I can see you all here. So thank you for coming. Today we have a bunch of people. So uh, with me, uh, you will see a bunch of new faces that are from nearby my home, hometown. So I know we are virtual, so people are, may come from far away, but uh, this time our guests are from uh, Turin. Uh, more or less as students or uh, or not, but uh, they are not too far away from where I live. So we are here to speak about Liquo and about Kubernetes. So if you are into edge computing or you want to know more about lifecycle dis uh, distribution across uh, many cloud providers, this is probably the right uh, meetup for you. But let's start uh, introducing all our guests. So I'm going to add all of them here and uh, here we are so thank you for being here i told you we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of people here today so it's gonna be hard to manage all of them uh, and the coordination won't be easy so um i'm gonna say sorry now so i'm done um alex do you want to introduce yourself Yes, yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Palesandro. Uh, I'm a research, research assistant at, uh, at Politecnico di Torino and one of the contributors of, uh, of LICO. Lorenzo. Hi, everybody. I'm Lorenzo Camicciolo, and I'm completing my master thesis here on LICO. Mattia. Hi, everybody. I'm Mattia Lavacca, and I'm a research fellow in uh, here at Politecnico di Torino. I'm working uh, with Lico for about one year. Alessandro. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Alessandro Olivero and uh, I'm a student at uh, Politecnico di Torino. Okay, uh, Alessandro, you are a bit quiet, so if you can figure out a way to uh, make your microphone a bit more louder moving forward, that would be uh, great. But so I'm going to, I mean, I don't have much to say. So thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to have somebody like students from Turin um, being here speaking about what they are doing. And I think it's it's always fun to know, uh, to learn from your research and see what actually is happening far away from where I usually like stay that is in, you know, organization and work related stuff. So uh, I'm very curious to, to see uh, what you got so far from us. But let's start. So Alexander, Alex is on you. OK, uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, so tonight we will talk about uh, about LICO. So it's a project we started one uh, one year ago. Uh, OK, so uh, the agenda of this talk is, uh, is pretty simple. We will have an introduction about the project, then have a look to the um, landscape of multi-cluster with, with Kubernetes, uh, then uh, go into the details of uh, of LICO, so the architecture, how does it work, and then have a demo of LICO working concretely. So uh, what can we say about the uh, us? So we are a group of uh, people from Politecnico di Torino. We started um, uh, one year ago working on multi-cluster topologies with Kubernetes. So far we had, uh, so we have this open source project, which has uh, 14 contributors and uh, so far, we had uh, one release, one first release in November. We are heading the second at the end of the month. Uh, so uh, when we started this project, we, we started from a discussion that we had. And uh, what, uh, oh, sorry for that. And what we observed was that Kubernetes is becoming the de facto standard for modern infrastructures. So um, it, it is gonna to be everywhere and it's not only on the cloud or on premise, but also on the edge. And this is rapidly expanding. And the, the result of that is that we have a tendency, the tendency of having uh, many, many clusters. So uh, an increasing amount of clusters and leading to what we call a cube sprawl. So uh, if we think to this phenomena, we can uh, observe that on, on one end, this became complex to, to manage and uh, opens the door to a lot of uh, uh, problems and pains, but also uh, opens the door to new possibilities. And, um, and this can be uh, more precisely discussed if you look to the uh, reason why we have so many clusters. So the first one, um, is about 
the organization structure. So sometimes organization have multiple departments which uh, spawn clusters, uh, each one for uh, is, um, it, its own reasons, and they are not really willing to cooperate, so they are not really putting the effort together. So this is kind of a bad and historical reason why we saw uh, plenty of clusters. This is not the most interesting one. Another, which can be more interesting than that, will be when we talk about multiple uh, infrastructure providers. So we can, for example, we want to optimize costs and we want to rely on multiple public clouds or multiple um, private clouds. So this can be, uh, in, we, can be, we can deal with it using multiple clusters. Another point is that sometimes we have geographical constraints on where we have to execute our applications. And so this can be enforced by uh, low prescriptions or for example, performance issues that force us to have uh, an application on a particular uh, location. So here again, multi-cluster can be a way to simplify the view of, of this problem. And another point is made with scalability. So Kubernetes cluster are not infinite. They can finish the amount of application that we can put inside. And therefore uh, we can use multiple cluster to, um, uh, to, to answer to, to this, uh, this uh, impossibility to scale, to scale uh, endlessly. Okay, so if we look to the multi-cluster uh, landscape, we see two recurring challenges that we can observe, uh, we, can, we can observe in, uh, uh, when dealing with this problem. The first question is about how we can orchestrate application across multiple clusters. We have to define in, uh, in a way a, a single point of orchestration or a point where we can observe all the cluster and decide to put a certain um, uh, pod or a certain part of our application on precisely one of those clusters. And again, this control plane has to be flexible as to handle, for example, dynamic change that may happen, for example, the change on the price of the, of the infrastructure or uh, if some of those clusters became not available to the other ones. And, and the other point is that if we put those applications on those different clusters, we have to find a way to interconnect them and let them talk in order to uh, provide the complete application to, to our users. So those are the two questions that we started asking ourselves. And uh, we did a bit of, the, of, um, of research of what uh, was existing. And we found, found that there are um, different projects able to answer the, um, those two questions. So we had project that handles the control plane issues and the networking part. So if we talk about control plane, um, we have, for example, KubeFed, which is the Kubernetes community project for dealing with multiple clusters. KubeFed uh, has a, for us a, an important limitation because it requires the user to change the API they are using to um, deploy their workload. And this is kindly, this is unwanted because we don't want to, um, to change them, change our application, change the way we, uh, we, use, to, uh, we use Kubernetes. On the other hand, uh, we have GitOps um, approaches, which are pretty popular. Uh, normally, we have a static binding, um, however, between one application and a set of clusters. So we say, OK, this application has to go on this cluster, and we use the, the pipelines to do so. This is kind of interesting, but limited, because we would like to have a dynamic uh, mm, scheduling of pods, for example, and change their location uh, with the, uh, the change of the environment, for example or if some condition in terms of price or, or failures are, uh, are happening. The other and last uh, solution that we observed was service mesh, which is pretty, pretty, um, which are, so there are plenty of different service meshes available. Uh, they are really rich in terms of features, but what they um, are also doing as KubeFed, they are introducing uh, new um, concepts, new API, and so we, we do not want to go uh, into this, uh, this scenario. So we do, would like to stay 
on Kubernetes, uh, Vanilla, in terms of API. So on the other end, on the networking part, we have some um, CNI provided way to interconnect different clusters. So the most popular one is Cilium. But again, the fact to be uh, stuck with a single specific CNI limit the interoperability of the, uh, of the solution. So uh, if I have, for example, an old cluster with a, a different CNI, I cannot interconnect it with my uh, cluster with Cilium, which is uh, not wanted. Obviously, and on the other end, the solution CNI agnostic uh, are not really um, meeting the requirements of interconnection that we would like to uh, obtain in uh, in uh, in our multi cluster um, scenario, where uh, all applications are able to uh, to communicate without change with uh, application on other clusters, and so we move to an integrated solution, so an integrated design. Uh, which lead to uh, LICO. So just uh, as a recap, what we uh, want as a design uh, um, requirements is, uh, okay, have no disruption for Kubernetes clusters. So for Kubernetes users, sorry. So the idea is, okay, we want to have multi-cluster without having new APIs as for KubeFed without having to change the application, the way they are designed, the way they, they work. And also, they can be straightforward to operate for cluster administrators. On the other hand, we do not want to make assumption about the cluster configuration. For, for example, CNIs or um, the fact that we have to patch the Kubernetes control plane with, uh, with particular um, code written by us. So we want to stay on vanilla Kubernetes or any compliant uh, Kubernetes cluster or distribution. And then we want to have an integrated approach between the control plane and the networking interconnection. So these are the three design requirements that we um, use for, for, um, at, at the beginning when we start uh, designing Lico. And the idea that to, what we want to obtain is um, a kind of the de decoupling layer between the application DevOps and the platform team. So the application DevOps, uh, it, it is now um, deploying uh, its application on a, um, a virtual cluster, which, has, which is completely um, abstract for him. So he is not really aware of all the real cluster that are behind this uh, virtual abstraction. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the platform team is able to do maintenance operation, cost optimization, or scaling of application uh, without uh, noticing the, uh, the application develops. So it, it, they have an abstraction which can allow them to uh, drain a node, for example, or move the application uh, destroying the pod and recreating them on another cluster without the need of a deployment. So um, when we talk about the, the API, trans API transparency, we have to uh, understand what does it mean concretely. So when we, have in a, when we are in a single cluster, what we want to obtain is, um, so we are just using Kubernetes. So we learn to use Kubernetes and we have those API, and it's pretty simple to, to understand. So then when we move using KubeFed uh, with different APIs, we have to change the way we are, uh, we are using to uh, deploy uh, our application to inspect them and so on. With Lico, the idea is to not introduce this, uh, this uh, layer of API here, but instead, uh, hide this complexity with, with a node, what we call the big node, which is a virtual twin of the remote cluster. So the API and the commands are the same in the single cluster and in the uh, LICO version of the multi-cluster, which is more comfortable uh, to for the user. So the idea, the Nico architecture, uh, again, the idea is not introduce any new uh, API to the, to the application DevOps and platform team. 
we just introduced few um, APIs used to configure Lico. And what we also um, did is to write a bunch of controllers that take care of um, all the different aspects of the Lico execution, of the execution of the, uh, the multi-cluster topology. So let's have a look more in uh, depth of what we are, um, how Lico handles multi-clusters. So again, we start from a discovery phase where we uh, look for clusters to, to, to peer with us. Then we have these peering phases. When we found one, we try uh, to uh, interconnect with it and negotiate the parameter of this interconnection. So of the uh, amount, for example, of, uh, of resources that have to be um, assigned to the node, the virtual node that we will create, and the uh, network interconnection. So when we have all the parameters, we move to the, the real network interconnection part, part where the uh, network interconnection is uh, concretely um, instantiated. And then we are able to uh, use the resources of the remote cluster creating what we called the virtual node. So this, this step makes the external resources available. And after that, we can just simply use the resources on the remote cluster. OK, so the first step is about discovery. So discovery is pretty much focused on let um, introduce some dynamicity in Lico, the dynamicity to uh, peer and unpeer to, um, to clusters and to new cam newcomers. So we have some methods like, for example, DNS that allow you to ask for new clusters and receive, for example, new um, parameters to connect to them. So we have obviously the API server to connect to the cluster and also other parameters like the endpoint for the, authentic the authentication in LICO. All those um, parameters that we collect about one cluster is, uh, are collected inside a foreign cluster, uh, CR. So a custom resource uh, stored in, the, in Kubernetes cluster, which models all the parameters that we have for, uh, for a certain cluster. So when we have this foreign cluster available, we start using the peering logic. So the peering process between two clusters uh, was built uh, um, on a protocol we created, um, uh, I think, one year ago. And we started from the concept of uh, having this protocol as much flexible as we can. So uh, there is no master involved. This is a completely peer-to-peer -peer protocol. And the, the peering um, process has to be established before we are able to, to share any resource. This protocol is, uh, um, is also flexible because it can support what we call multi-ownership. So the fact that not all the cluster have to uh, belong to the same uh, owner, but they can be owned by different owners. And so, for example, K4 and K5 have a different owner and decide to share some resources. Uh, at the end of the peering process, what we obtain is the specification of a uh, new big node and a viable network configuration. So now we are ready to move to the network interconnection part. So uh, let's start with the, the network saying, uh, um, in particular, what we uh, want as the model for, for our networking in LICO. So the main idea here is to say, uh, let's imagine that we have here a non-cluster. So this part here is a non-cluster. And we have a namespace A. And now we have a foreign cluster here. And we have a namespace B. So in LICO, we are able to create a map between uh, a mapping between A and B and say and treat this as a single namespace. So from the home cluster, when we, for example, get the pods of A, we will be able to see all the, all the pods also which are in B. This is kind of useful. And the, the next thing is, OK, we have this model, but how can I use them? So 
which is the networking model that we have here. And what we wanted to obtain is exactly the same networking model that we have in Kubernetes. So a certain pod here has to be able to talk, to, to communicate with an, a pod on the other side. Uh, and this can be obtained by uh, our logic, so the logic of uh, the natural fabric of Lico. Uh, there is a complexity in addition, because if we do not have any constraints of, for example, about the, the address that pods can have, we can have one pods, which is, I don't know, 10, 0, 0, 1 here, and 10, 0, 0, 1 here. This is completely possible because um, we have two cluster and we can have uh, the hardware space of pods, so what we call the, the pod cider, overlapping. So what we implemented here is a matching service that is able to map this address on a different um, cider, which is uh, usable from the other cluster. So this is uh, something that we uh, implemented in 01, and this is also available uh, in 02, with the support also of multiple CNI. So the idea is, again, to be uh, not really tied to a specific CNI. Uh, OK. Uh, between the clusters, so we have this nothing, uh, nothing service on each cluster, but also we have a, uh, an interconnection, a kind of a VPN, which allows the, the traffic to go from one cluster to the other. To the other. So when the network is set up and we are happy with it, we can uh, start uh, to use our big node or our virtual node. So the, the idea of big nodes is to have a structure, so a, an object in Kubernetes, which is completely equivalent to the traditional node that we have. So those objects are uh, currently manipulated by the Kubernetes control plane uh, without any modification. And so we can, they can, for example, schedule pods on, on this node without any modification. So we can just plug Lico and we will be able to, to use this, uh, this node. Um, so when you use a normal node, we normally have a component called the kubelet, which is responsible to update information about that node and also schedule pods of that node. So uh, what we um, use to um, take care of the life cycle of pods and of the virtual node is what we call a virtual a Lico virtual kubelet. So the Lico virtual kubelet is a fork of the Virtual Kubelet project. Uh, Virtual Kubelet project is a project started, I think, by, by Microsoft, which allows you to um, schedule pods of, on a remote provider. Uh, and you have uh, one interface that you can implement to offload those pods to some, something like, for example, uh, in our case, Kubernetes. So we wrote a driver to capable to offload pods to another Kubernetes cluster implementing this scenario. So how does it work uh, concretely? First, we have so a user here that decides to um, create a new deployment, completely normally on, normal on, uh, on Kubernetes. Then we have a uh, controller manager here, so controller manager from Kubernetes, which generates the, the pod replicas. And the scheduler will decide to schedule this uh, pod on the virtual node. So when it is scheduled on the virtual node, the instance of the virtual kubelet responsible for that will create on the foreign cluster a replica set um, mapping completely the specification of this pod. And this replica set will generate a pod instance um, with a label that allows the kubelet to bind them, to bind it to the um, pod on the home cluster. So this uh, pod AAX6 on the home cluster is the shadow pod of this pod on the, um, on the remote cluster. So th the reason why we are using a replica set to do so is to avoid the, the, the behavior when 
for example, we have a problem on the virtual kubelet and some, somehow the pod here is deleted. There is no one which will recreate the pod, the pod and allow um, has to have the application, so the pod running on the remote cluster. So if we use a replica set, we will have some logic local to the foreign cluster able to recreate the pod if the pod is destroyed. After this, uh, so the, the, the um, deployment of the pod, what we have also is to um, is the virtual kubelet, which will be able, which is uh, uh, keep track, which keeps tracking the information about the remote pod to the local shadow pod. So this uh, pod can be used by the system administrator, by the application DevOps, to observe the state of the remote pod using normal kubectl get pods, for example. There is no change on the uh, API used by the, um, the user. Another important feature that we implemented uh, to make application uh, work transparently is about endpoint reflection. So as we mentioned before, we do not have to change application uh, to, to run in a multi-cluster scenario. So normally when, when we use to uh, make two pod communicate, we use what we call a service. So a service is an abstraction in Kubernetes. Uh, so it's, I think it's really, um, if you are using Kubernetes, you are familiar with this abstraction. I will try to, to explain what it is uh, for the other one. So the idea is that here we have a um, virtual IP that allow us to um, send traffic to different pods. So here, for example, we have a replica set, which is controlling three pods. And those pods are um, seen as part of the service. And so there is some logic in Kubernetes, in the controller manager, that creates the resource of the endpoint. And this endpoint is used to um, instruct the different technology used to, to send traffic, for example, EP tables, to um, to send traffic to the pod, so the, the actual application that have to receive that traffic. So in this scenario, we have two pods that have been scheduled on the own cluster and one pod which, is, which has been scheduled on the foreign cluster. So on the own cluster, everything is fine because this shadow pod is uh, seen by the controller manager and so the controller manager will create the endpoint here um, that can be used to send traffic to this yellow pod on the other side. So this is kind of really, really uh, simple to obtain. The, the problem is when we have someone here, for example, another pod that want to communicate with this service. So this endpoint will be there because the pod is uh, executed here. But then when we replicate, so we have all, always, always to replicate this service, but the service will just have this single endpoint. Why? Because those endpoints have no any parts here, so they cannot be created by the controller manager. And this is uh, something that we uh, performed in the virtual kubelet using what we call the endpoint slice reflection. So at the end of the day, if your pod that have to use this service is scheduled on the own cluster or on the foreign cluster, you will be able to use, to use the service that you want to reach, even if the endpoint are on the other cluster. Okay, so um, we have so as we mentioned before, we have this uh, uh, we had this uh, first release on November. We implemented some uh, features about uh, peering and uh, discovery. So it was the very first version. Um, we move in the 02, focusing more on cloud public clouds. So we changed a bit the way we handle tenant authentication and network interconnection to deal with a, a geographic scenario where we have clusters um, that have to communicate across the internet. And also we add the support four pods in detached mode, uh, as we uh, discussed earlier. 
so we expect to have this uh, this zero two uh, out in in February, and also we are planning the uh, zero three version. In particular, we will think to focus on uh, uh, having the network working for more than two clusters, and also enlarge the compat uh, the compatibility metrics for more cloud providers and CNIs. So if you like the LICO and if you want to contribute to this project, uh, we have an official website. We have uh, a repository. You can uh, uh, go there and open an issue if you find uh, something interesting or something that you want to ask. We have also a biweekly community meeting where you can uh, join. We discuss about the LICO design and, and uh, the next steps. And also we have uh, a Slack workspace where you can join on our website. You can find a shared invite and you can drop a message when you want. We are we will get to we will be glad to answer you. Uh, okay, so I think it's demo time. So I will leave the floor uh, to, to the guys for the demo. I just want you to uh, thank you for the presentation and just to be. I'm totally sure we got a question that is about using Liquo for uh, like a single provider. So that this, I presume it works for both, even if you're using only one uh, cloud provider or multiple one. So, uh, so far, I think the, the so I, I will give my, my answer, but then uh, uh, guys will correct me if I'm wrong. So I think we, we are, so, for, so far we are focused on one public provider and one private cloud because we found that the hybrid cloud is something pretty common and can be interesting for more people. But we see no uh, limitation for having multiple providers. So for the moment, we tested it pretty in depth with Azure and, uh, and traditional private Kubernetes clusters with KubeADM. But uh, I, I do not see limitation in that sense. OK, so it's time to bring here with us more people <laughs> because we have a demo. So we have to ask the demo gods to be kind with us because I know demos are never easy as they should be. And they can be a bit stressful, so be with us. And yeah, I mean, let, you are online. The screen is shared. And yeah, show us what Lico can do. Thank you, Gianluca. OK, um, I'm going to describe you this demo scenario. We uh, have this web application. Uh, in this web application, well, th this web application has been developed by Google. Uh, it is a simply web shop. And um, it is a, a, an application developed in microservices. There are uh, about 11 microservices that communicate uh, each other. For providing you a common, pretty common service for buying stuffs and and uh, suggest you products uh, similar to the ones that you are that you have already watched and so on. Well, it, it is it is a pretty common uh, website for selling stuffs. We took this uh, web application in the microservices and we uh, <clears throat> deployed in our on-premise cluster. We have one cluster in uh, uh, Politecnico. And uh, in this cluster, the uh, application uh, is exposed to the internet through the link that uh, we are going to provide you. I don't know if uh, uh, someone already provided the, the link, but I, I guess that uh, you will get in a in a minute um okay there we go <clears throat> through this link uh, you can uh, explore the the website you can experience the responsiveness the smoothness of the website well the website is not our website is a website provided by google so we are just in, we are just using it for uh showing you how can how Lico can uh help us to handle with uh, a common pretty common problem so this is the scenario we have this application uh, deployed in the private cluster and uh, we are going to stress this application with a bunch of new users uh, simulated through a um 
testing framework, a load testing framework called Locust. Locust is a pretty common framework written in Python that will create uh, an, am an increasing amount of users over time um, that is deputed to uh, stress uh, the website. At a certain time, we will not have enough resources for hosting all the replicas that we are going to in a, we are going to create in an automatic way through an HPA. Uh, we, we will not have enough resources in our nodes, so uh, we will have some pod uh, impending status, and we would like to have a new node for handling correctly the load increasing created by the swarm users. At that point, we will uh, join uh, our cluster with another one in uh, AKS. So we will have a cluster in uh, Polytechnico, an on-premise cluster, joined with uh, the pub a public cluster, um, a managed public cluster in AKS. Okay, so let's take a look at the Grafana dashboard that uh, will help us to monitor how the uh, this demo will, uh, will go. We have a bunch of uh, square panels at the top. The, the first ones are the local status that uh, well, simply tells uh, which is the status of Locust. The Locust, uh, as I said before, is the uh, framework that we are going to use. Swarm users is the number of users that is um, using, that, that is connecting to the website, to all the endpoints exposed by the website. Then we have three panels uh, running uh, uh, crash loopback off and pending pods that aim at uh, telling us how many pods we, uh, we have uh, in uh, running status, uh, crash loopback off status and pending status. The pod, obviously the pods are the pod that compose the, 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 the application. So the pod that compose the, the microservices uh, of the application. Then the last three uh, squares are the current RPS, which is the number, the amount of uh, requests per second that are triggered by the Swarmed users uh, uh, created by Locust. And the current success and current failure ratio uh, are the number of success and uh, failures uh, is, is the percentage of success and failures over the total amount of uh, requests per second. Then we have uh, a few more panels. Uh, the, the left one is the spawned replica. So we have all those microservices. As I said before, the website is composed by those 11. I am, if, I, if I remember correctly, the, we have 11 microservices and we have a bunch of replicas already uh, created. And um, we set up a HPA, an horizontal pod autoscaler, for all of those. So we set up a rule for uh, scaling up and down the replicas for the deployments based on the CPU consumption uh, of the pod and the response time, the average response time. Then we have the Swarmed users that uh, um, shows us the number of users uh, uh, over time. So we will see uh, a line, a slope uh, that will uh, tell us uh, how many users uh, uh, are, are being created over time. Then we have two uh, panels related to the application uh, application data, application performance, which are the response time, the average response time for all the microservices and the error rate. So by monitoring those panels, uh, we can see how uh, good the application is responding to our stress. And the last one is the Lico Gateway. Uh, Lico Gateway is a, a pod that is in charge of connecting the two clusters and to uh, <clears throat> send and receive traffic between them. So we are expected to see uh, an increasing amount of traffic uh, in the Lico gateway uh, in the moment uh, that the, the, new, the, the new node of Lico will, uh, uh, will appear in, uh, in our cluster. 
Uh, on the left, we have uh, simply two terminals. The top one is deputed to perform some operations uh, on LICO, um, LICO data structure, LICO custom resource, and for uh, observing the new nodes and so on. And uh, the bottom one is deputed to uh, observe the events regarding the pod uh, of our microservices uh, of the application. So let's start with the, with the demo. Ah, okay, uh, first we can we can take a look at the online boutique. We can I think Alessandro we can uh, simply navigate a bit and uh, perform some operation. Feel free to 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 navigate uh, in this uh, in this application and uh, well. I think that we, we, we can start with the with this test. Okay, with Locust, uh, we are going to set up um, a total amount of users of 1,500 uh, by creating five users per second. So we will reach a total amount of user, uh, a total amount of 1,500 uh, by increasing five per second. Let's start swarming. And Locust will start uh, creating five new users per second and uh, asking for our website, all uh, the microservices that serve uh, our website. <clears throat> what, uh, what you are expected to see here is that the response time obviously is uh, zero micro milliseconds. So because it is not uh, stressed, we are go we are going to see uh, an increase of the response time uh, of this warmed user, obviously, and there is the possibility that the error rate will increase over time because the amount of replicas that we have in our deployment is not enough for serving all the traffic requested by the users that uh, Locust is creating. Uh, the, in this scenario, we have the nodes that host not only our website, our web service, well, this web service, but we we are uh, we have uh, we can have a lot of services deployed in uh, our cluster, uh, a lot of web service, databases, uh, controllers, and so on. So the, this is the condition in which the nodes are almost full. We have uh, a node with uh, 98 and 99%. So, <clears throat> so uh, we, can, we can see that there is no more enough uh, resources for scaling up our application. As you can see in the terminal below, the uh, new pods are going to be created. So the, there is the creation, periodic creation of new pods. This is performed in automatic way by the HPA that I mentioned before. Uh, in the heat map of the spawned replica, we can see that there is an, an increasing of the, of the replicas that are going to be created by the HPAs. This is a, per, uh, a percentage, so uh, the color of the heat map is related to the uh, total amount of replicas that uh, are allowed to be created by the HPA. If you take a look at this uh, at the website right now, you should experience some delay, some uh, a, a decrease of the responsiveness of the website and the smoothness in the navigation. And this is because, well, we are uh, about 40 users, I don't know, 50 users plus one, 1,000, I, I don't know, how many we are uh, we are right now? Okay, so 780 users. Um, an interesting thing is, is that the pending pods counter is increasing because we don't have enough resources in our physical nodes for hosting them and for running them. So uh, right now in our cluster, in our private cluster, on-premise cluster, we cannot do anything uh, unless deleting some other pods for uh, leaving some space, for freeing some space in our nodes, because th th there is no alternative. Well, in this scenario, uh, 
uh, Lico comes and uh, we will uh, join our private cluster with a public one, with a AKS cluster, and we will create at runtime, we will see at runtime, a new node automatically created by the Lico control plane. This node is uh, like a proxy toward the remote cluster and uh, all the pending pods uh, will be scheduled in an automatic way on that new node. Okay, uh, we are waiting that the, 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 use, the number of users is reaching the top. I can see we can take a look uh, at the Lico control plane pods, um, Alessandro. Okay, well, this is the namespace Lico in which we deployed uh, the control plane of, of Lico, and the control plane serves uh, all the uh, aspects that Alex mentioned before. So we have some pods regarding the networking, such as the Lico route, Lico gateway, and so on. Then we have some pods regarding the discovery part. Indeed, we have the discovery pod. Then we have the peer request operator that are needed for uh, connecting one cluster to another one. And uh, uh, that's it. A curious fact, we don't have any pod regarding the virtual kubelet that Alex mentioned before, because we don't have any uh, peering yet. So we, we cannot, we, we, we will see, we are expected to see a new pod uh, of the virtual kubelet when we will join with, Lico, with the, the, the remote cluster through Lico. I think that uh, we, we reached the top of uh, our simulation and, uh, and uh, we, we, we can join with Lico. Yes, thank uh, uh, Gianluca. The, the website should be very, very stressed right now. Indeed, uh, if you take a look at the response time and the error rate, they are dramatic right now. <clears throat> then uh, Alessandro is uh, performing a simple operation to have uh, custom resource in the Lico namespace. Uh, well, no, uh, a custom resource of Lico. And uh, this is uh, in this operation, we just uh, patch a, a field of the spec of the foreign cluster and set. Uh, we, we are going to set the join field to true. Let's let's go. Okay. <clears throat> if we if we if we watch uh, the node right now, we should see uh, a new node spawning up in a couple of seconds, because the peering pro the peering process is uh, happening. Uh, the two clusters are exchanging some resources and a new node has appeared. This node is uh, a ready node. The scheduler is scheduling all the pending pods on that node because it has enough resources to host them. And uh, we should be able to absorb all the traffic that uh, is going to be created by the users because uh, we the, the, the website should be uh, very, very, very stressed right now. Okay, as you can see, the, pen, the pending pod counter is decreasing. Uh, it means that the new node has received the pods, and you can see it in the uh, CPU request percentage per node the panel. We have a Lico node that is full at 49%. And uh, another interesting thing is that the Lico gateway traffic is serving traffic. Uh, there is uh, incoming and outgoing traffic between the two different clusters. All this traffic uh, is served by the VPN handled by the Lico gateway. <clears throat> the response time uh, should be, we, we, should, we should see the response time of the website uh, decreasing over time because we are absorbing the load uh, created by Lico. Okay, let's wait a couple of seconds. I, I think that we can go back in the terminal and take a look again at the Lico namespace. So let's 
<clears throat> let's get the pods in uh, Lincoln namespace. OK, we have a new pod. This pod is the virtual kubelet. This is the pod that is taking care about the pod lifecycle, endpoint lifecycle, services, config maps, secrets, and so on between the two different clusters. So we have all the endpoints in the home cluster, in the on-premise cluster that have been replicated in the foreign cluster, translated and replicated in the foreign clusters. <clears throat> and uh, well, uh, I think that we can go back in the website and experience uh, a little bit more if the the, the, the experience uh, is getting better and uh, well, we can uh, place an order, keep browsing, and I, I think that we, we feel that the experience in the navigation, in the web navigation, is getting more and more better. This is because we scale up, we scaled up, many pods have been created, many pods uh, staled in uh, pending status, we didn't have enough resources to host them. And uh, Lico arrived, and we scheduled all those pods in, uh, uh, in, the, in the remote cluster, in AKS. <clears throat> OK. Mm, I think that we can stop our test. We absorbed all the uh, requests that have been created by our user, our new users that have been created. Uh, <clears throat> yes, yes, of course. If we if we take a look uh, uh, at the traffic toward AKS, sorry, uh, Alessandro, we can look that uh, we reached uh, about sixty megabit per second of traffic uh, in uh, in outgoing. <clears throat> Then uh, we can, I think that we can stop the, the test. Perfect. Uh, Locust is. Locust sometimes um, <coughs> is a bit, a bit slow to stop the, the test, so we can. We can experience a, a, a smooth slope uh, in the swarmed users uh, plot, uh, but this is not a problem. It is just for, uh, we, we, we would like just to stop immediately the, the test. It is, uh, it can be, a, uh, the, the, sometimes there is a pretty, um, Locust is pretty slow to scale down the number of users, but we, we, it is not important in this context. Um, what we are going to do here uh, at the moment in which Locust will stop down uh, is uh, an ampere of the remote cluster um, so that the new node that we created, with that we just created five minutes ago, will disappear and uh, we, uh, we will go back to our uh, previous cluster status. So we will go back to our um, cluster with two nodes, with our workloads, and uh, we don't need any more those resources that we had to add for facing the problem, the, 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 increasing, the increasing load. Okay, so what we, are, what we just have to do is, to, is the Ampere operation, okay? As you can see, the Swarmed users are uh, decreasing over time slowly, but okay. And um, yes, I, I think that we can we can uh, we can kill the locus pod so, so that okay, perfect. It is to zero. Good. Uh, we reached zero swarm users, so the test is ended up. We don't need. Lico anymore for connecting those uh, the, our clusters, and we just have to uh, perform a similar operation for unjoin the clusters. So we set 
the field join of the spec of the foreign cluster false. Okay, so we patched the resource. We can see that the, the node is in not ready status and there is a plenty of events uh, regarding the pod of the <clears throat> of the of our microservices that are uh, in uh, terminating status. <clears throat> okay, the Lico node has disappeared, and there is a plenty of pods in pending status. We we are going to see it in the okay. Uh, the panel in Grafana has been updated. And uh, we have all of those pending pods because <clears throat> we don't have the node anymore. So those pods uh, are in pending status. And since uh, we are not, they are not stressed anymore because the test is over, uh, they, will be they will be deleted uh, by the HPA uh, after a certain amount of time in an automatic way. Uh, right now, if you go back to the website, uh, there is no more stress and we should be able to navigate and to have a, a good experience of uh, web browsing. And that's it, I guess. So thank you. I have to say this is a pretty cool demo. I mean, I saw many of them and this one is very good. It's, it's very hard to describe the scale of an application. So thank you for, for preparing us for, for this talk. It's a very cool one. So it's time to put all of you back again. So be dressed because you're going to be on stage. Um, let's see. I think you're all in now. So those are the people that worked uh, behind the scenes to have this cool demo working. Um, so thank you for that. I have a couple of questions. Um, I didn't know Locust before, so I think I'm going to check it out because it sounds very cool. Um, do you know, do you have any tips for like newcomers from that tool? I know it doesn't, like, it's not about your, your, your demo, but I got surprised by that tool. So I want to know more. Whoever can pick it, just, <laughs> I don't know if he's the expert about Locust. Uh, some, some some hints about Locust. Yeah. Well, uh, it is pretty easy to use, but uh, for a, for a newcomer, I mean. But uh, um, for a um, deep configuration, for a precise configuration, it is pretty pretty hard. I mean. Uh, there is a, you can specify, you can launch uh, Locust by specifying a uh, Locust file, which is a simply, a simple uh, Python file and uh, Locust will uh, start uh, polling all those endpoints uh, one after the other. So with a weight parameter, you can measure how many endpoints are hit compared to the other ones. Okay, so let's get back to Liquid now. Uh, <laughs> I, we have a question about, like, uh, you show us what happened when you joined the uh, remote cluster and how load got spread to uh, to the remote cluster you just, did, just joined. Um, did you measure the difference uh, in behavior compared with the cluster already joined uh, but in, in more like a quiet state. I mean, I think the uh, Gabri want to Gabri want to know if there is like th how differently is in terms of in terms of like adaptiveness if the cluster was already registered compared with the demo you showed where you had to register the cluster. Well, uh, we we didn't experience. Uh, uh delays additional delays uh, uh, for uh, clusters uh, peered uh, at runtime I, I mean we we just have uh, a bunch of seconds for having the new node being created and for the new node being uh, configured by all the um, networking configuration 
and uh, after that the flow is uh, the same as uh, the, the clusters already peered. So it is a question of seconds. Okay, that's cool. And I think coming from like my experience, like even if even if the traffic looked like impossible to you know predict and to figure out in advance. Um, if you know the application, and if you look at your application like on a daily basis, you can always figure out a few patterns. Like even like all the marketplaces and online like e-commerce knows that the Black Friday is the day they have to take care of the traffic. So um, my suggestion is if you know your when your Black Fridays are, be prepared and register the, the clusters before, but just as you do normally. Uh, with the with any other like clustering application so this is a good practice you have to do uh but knowing that the difference is just a couple of seconds even if you don't have an idea that the spike is coming it's a very it's a very good addiction to um to this project so uh a question i i mean alex um, at the beginning of the demo said that kubernetes is gonna you know it's coming as a standard uh, as a common layer for all the infrastructure and for all the companies and i see that happening obviously because uh, it's true uh, i'm curious to know if you if you like it as a standard or not or what do you want to uh how do you want it to change if you have any suggestion or you know from your perspective because i know that there are strong perspective from you know the uh from the company I work for, whatever, but from like you as a student and you know touching the project, uh, what do you? Is it good as a standard? Can we trust it as a standard, or do you want it to change some way? I I, I think that we can we can treat it as a as a standard because uh, we we saw we we have been working with Kubernetes. I'm with I've been working with Kubernetes for one year, for around one year. And uh, we developed, we used many APIs, standard APIs, and uh, uh, the, the impression is that uh, Kubernetes is, is, is getting uh, more stable and uh, the, the standard, I, I think, we can, I don't know. I, I think <laughs> it is becoming a star. I don't know. Alex might maybe can be a different opinion. <laughs> uh, no, yes. Yeah, I'm here uh, for the big questions. <laughs> and also, I think that the, the thing that it's really interesting for me in Kubernetes is uh, it's the sensibility that is able to, to provide. So, for example, when we started working with Lico, we used a lot the mechanism that uh, Kubernetes offers you, like CRD or, or 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 everything you can you can really uh, every you can use what the Kubernetes components are using for your applications, and this is really nice. And for example, in OpenStack, the was the the last uh, decades um, cloud uh, stuff. Uh, I didn't uh, see the um, the same flexibility, the same extensibility. So it was really difficult to create uh, an, an ecosystem inside. So this is why I personally appreciate a lot Kubernetes. Yeah, I, I agree. And also, it also helps you it enforce like good practices, like all the control, like machines and the controllers you have to implement for the CRDs uh, are a scalable and reliable pattern that you can use. And I personally learned about it, like, uh, developing Kubernetes and looking at the code itself. So that, that was a very good uh, learning experience I had. And it also gives you like authentication, audit logs and um, authorization. So stuff that usually when you are rushing at work, you, you know, sometimes it's easy to forget about them. But if you use Kubernetes, all those stuff are there for you and you just have to use that. So that's very, that's another powerful like addition, I think that we, that Kubernetes brings to us. Um, Last last question, I presume, uh, if nothing shows up in chat, is about like the evolution of, of this um, like this project. I I know that it's not a project that is like started uh, with this idea in mind. It's a subset of a much bigger idea. Uh, so if you can spend some word about why Lico is 
as it is and what do you want to uh you know uh test with these projects so thank you yeah yes yeah, cool, you can <laughs> Okay, so it's my time. So yeah, uh, Lico starts uh, from uh, a very simple observation. So um, in the cloud, we, we made a, a huge advance when we started to think about the data center instead of uh, a single server. So uh, when we deploy a job, we simply say, okay, let's go to the cloud and who cares about the single server? Um, if you think about this idea, uh, this is really not happening in different environments like uh, enterprise, at home. So I, I'm still using the PC and my PC in order to start my apps. I'm my, still using my uh, embed assistant to control my robot or, or, or something like that. So we're still very much linked to the physical world in terms of uh, uh, computing. So Lego started from this very simple observation when I recognized that at home, uh, I have something like uh, almost uh, 25 uh, devices uh, uh, with CPUs at home. Uh, originally, I didn't, didn't rec rec recognize this because I say, okay, I have some computer, a couple of smartphones, it can be 10, 25, not 10, 25. So we have a huge amount of processing power there and we are really not using that processing power in the best way. So we simply uh, are very um, far away from what we got in the data center. So how we got that in the data center, sharing resources uh, efficiently, also in terms of resource consumption, energy consumption, using Kubernetes, using Cloud Orchestrator. So that's the starting point of the project. Let's try to use Cloud Orchestrator also on other devices. And here is where the adventure starts. And then we said, okay, so in order to be more appealing with the industry, we have to target some shorter term goals like uh, multi-cluster, Kubernetes and so on. But you know, also here, we have this kind of multi-tenancy, multi-ownership, uh, multi okay? Which is pretty common in the physical world because I have my devices, my neighbor has its own devices, but maybe it would be nice to use the, the devices of my the, the, my neighbor. So, you know, here is where everything started. And here is where, uh, as a research point of view, because we work in university right now, we would like to go. I don't know. I see, I mean, it, it looks like everybody had its own data center and we don't use it. Like it's a waste of CPUs. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add from your side, guys. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you for taking the time to share your research with us. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, I hope you will come back to talk more about the end goal. Yeah, I think we lost to Gianluca. <laughs> 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 I'm back. I don't okay. see you again. Okay. okay, sorry. I just want to say thank you. And if you don't have anything to add, I think we can call it done for this, for today. Three. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. One. That's it. So thank you um, for the audience. Check out Liquo on GitHub and on their website because it's you're gonna hear about them more and more uh, moving forward. And yeah, thank you for joining us. Bye bye. <laughs>